Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. And one way in which the world really works is to really understand that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. You see, a lot more around our lives never changes than we'd think. And part of that is because we are dazzled by technology. Technology camouflages how little things have changed. In reality, so much of our lives are shaped by the things that never change. We all eat in order to stay alive. We all enjoy eating. We all sleep for about a third of our lives or maybe a little less. In fact, if you look at the five F's that I am constantly talking about, And again, if you are a new uh, subscriber or a new listener and you don't know what I mean when I say the five F's, that's the letter F, the sixth letter of the English alphabet, standing for family, friends, finance, faith, and fitness. And if you don't yet have the free ebook download on that, why don't you go and get it and you'll know what I'm talking about. You just go to rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, get the free download book called The Holistic You. Why do I call the book The Holistic You? Because the whole point of what I speak about, and when I teach about the five Fs, the clear lesson is that our lives are lived on the basis of good scores in all the five F's. You can't leave out one and and hope to do okay on all the others. That's just not how things really work, not how the world really works. And so, uh, you know, just look at those again. Look at the five F's, family. Has anything changed? The fact remains that today people came from a mother and a father. Now, did your mother and father stay together and build and nourish and grow a loving family all along? I hope so, but that's not true for everybody, right? Not everybody had that. Um, People formed their own families. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. And people discover that their deepest sense of security and happiness flows from their families. So, uh, are there ways to live without family? To some extent, yes, but it's not ideal, Uh, and nothing has changed. Your grandfather and your grandmother also came from a mother and a father, and they might have had siblings with with whom they had good relationships or tense relationships, and they had uncles and aunts whom they found close and warm and loving, or awkward and a little bit distant, but there they all were. And so if we would run into our grandparents or our great-grandparents, one of the things we could talk about and we would have in common is family. How about friends? Yeah, your grandparents had friends, as you do. Uh, They may have spoken to them on the telephone or in person. Uh, They may not have been able to FaceTime with their friends, but they had friends just as you do. Finance. Nothing has changed. Yes, I know you can convey money to somebody on Venmo and you can buy stuff on the Internet and, and you can do your banking without walking out of your house. All of that is true. But the fundamentals don't change. They really don't. Not one little bit. And so uh, everybody then, a long time ago, or now, or tomorrow, everybody 
needs money. And money is indeed used as a medium of transfer. And we all have done that, and we all continue to do that. And we all worry about it. And guess what? Men and women, generally speaking, look at money very differently. And so I look at money much more like my grandfather did than like my daughter does. And Mrs. Lappin looks at money much more like her grandmother did than like her son does. That's right. These are real things. Uh, money doesn't change. The, the kind of money, the usage of money, the value of money, these all change. But uh, if I would meet your great-grandparents and I would say to them, I am doing my best to teach your great-grandchild how to grow in with their families and with their friendships and their finances and their faith and their fitness, your great-grandparents would say, fantastic, I know just what you're talking about, and I'm so pleased that they have a mentor. It would be something like that, you see. Uh, whereas if you spoke to your great-grandparents about um, a merchant who has a big shop and his name is uh, Mr. Bezos and that he's going into space or he went into space, you'd lose your grand great-grandparents. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. So the five Fs, family, friends, finance, faith. That hasn't changed. Your great-grandparents had faith. They might have been more firmly attached to their faith than you are. That's possible. But um, that only makes my point. And then finally, fitness, physical health, <laughs> just as much a concern of your great-grandparents as of you. You know, maybe they didn't spend as much time in a gym, but their lifestyle, whether they were on a farm or in a city, uh, they tended to have a tougher lifestyle than you. That's one of the things that has changed. When I say that technology has only camouflaged how little things have changed, that is true. But one of the things technology has done is uh, compensated for lesser human beings. We are not, um, in general terms, we are not as strong or as resilient uh, as our great-grandparents were. They generally dealt with a rougher, tougher life than we have. And, uh, and we, being lesser than they, make up for it by using technology to achieve even more than they did. And uh, this is a, a very real thing. When you're dealing with uh, friends and family, finance, faith, and fitness, uh, you're dealing with things that simply don't change. They are so fundamental to the successful life that they are just as relevant to you as they were to your great-grandparents. And last week, I told you about a couple that came to see me where the husband was hoping to persuade me to persuade his wife to stay in the marriage because, as he put it, I only made one little mistake. The one little mistake was he had an affair uh, with a woman he met on Facebook. And, uh, you know, just made one little mistake. You know, can't she forgive me? And I I told you my analysis of that last week and uh, why I told him he was completely wrong. He did not make one little mistake. What he did was something quite different, and I covered that last week. But I wanted to make a little bit of a correction because I think I may have inadvertently left you uh, last week with, with one error. Uh, it is true that I did uh, successfully managed to encourage the wife to stay in the marriage. I did. And they did. And thank God they are doing well. And I am quite confident, as are they. They are very grateful that they didn't throw the towel in on the marriage, she particularly. They, they really are. But what I want to clarify is that I did not say to her, you must forgive him and stay in the marriage. Absolutely not. I said, I encourage you to consider remaining in the marriage. He wants me 
to ask you to forgive him. I don't see how I can do that, and I don't see how you can do that. I can't imagine how you could possibly think of forgiving him. But staying in the marriage does not necessarily mean that you have to forgive him for what he did. Now, I think it's quite possible that if you do remain married and you both work on the marriage and you both nurture the marriage, I think it's very possible that in 10 years' time you might forgive him. Really, yeah, I I think that's very possible because by then, in the overall scheme of things in the marriage, the relative uh, weight of the reservoirs of goodwill and of resentment will be such that you will be able to look back on this unpleasant and down period in your marriage and say, you know what, it's past and I I forgive you. You've done so much good and you've been such a wonderful husband and such a wonderful father to our children. You've built such a a fantastic family and taken such good care of us. Of course, I forgive you. But I can see that happening in 10 years' time. So when I uh, encouraged and I said, I really want you to think about staying in the marriage and working on it, provided your husband makes a serious and wholehearted commitment to do absolutely everything in his power to do the same thing, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily forgive now. You can stay in the marriage while still not forgiving him. That takes a lot of time. And I just want to clarify that uh, forgiveness is not a prerequisite for moving forward in a situation. You can quite easily say to somebody, look, I'm not ready to forgive you yet, but I'm also not ready to write off, you know, 10 years of a relationship, 8 years, 9 years, 12 years of a relationship. Uh, We both have too much invested in our partnership, in our marriage, in our relationship, in in friendship, whatever it is. Uh, and so I'm not ready to um, I'm not ready to for- forgive what you did, uh, and if you are willing to move forward on the basis that down the road I hope to be able to forgive you, but that meanwhile we're moving forward together, then I am too, and that's exactly what happened uh, with this particular couple. Um, I also want to mention, and this this uh, particularly applies mostly to the Jewish listeners of the show, and that is that uh, I will be the scholar in residence for a Passover retreat uh, for eight days in Mexico in April 2022. So uh, please contact me at the website if you're interested in more information. I will also try and make sure that in the uh, description of today's show, there will be a link so you can find out more about this event. But um, uh, it's an opportunity to to get together with others who want to celebrate the festival of Passover and uh, to renew their relationship with the entire idea of growth and change of redemption and uh, of moving forward from the conditions that we call slavery, which which extend way beyond merely the physical environment of slavery. Anyway, all of that at uh, the Passover retreat in the spring of 2022. And I mention it now only because it's uh, filling up fast and people who do want to participate in that with me need to um, hurry along and get in touch and make plans and uh, make bookings for that event. So um, those of you who want to be there, I look forward to seeing you then. Now, uh, I think you'll agree that if there is one topic you absolutely did not expect to hear your rabbi talking about on this show, that would be a discussion about the sexiest man alive. Well, that is, I'm afraid, what we need to talk about for a few moments, because I want to do my best to equip you with the tools to understand things you read, things you hear about, things you see. In other words, if ancient Jewish wisdom is going to be of any benefit to you at all, as I bring it to you on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, then it's got to make your living 
from day to day more effective, more successful, more enjoyable, uh, more durable. And part of that is being able to interpret information correctly. And so uh, here we are, uh, don't ask how, but across my radar screen comes a column written by an interesting British journalist called Krista de Souza. Um, Krista de Souza's father was an immigrant to England from India, and um, uh, he and his wife did very well. They had their daughter, Krista, and uh, then they divorced, and after a number of years have gone by, they remarried, which I think uh, reminds us that, as King Solomon said, that when you live life with the wife of your youth, there really is some benefit in that. And that's why I often speak about the advantage of marrying young. I, adv I speak about the advantage of being married to somebody who's had no prior intimate experiences. There are huge advantages to this. And, you know, you, you look at it again just from the point of view of a woman, um, you know, why would you want your most youthful, fertile, and, if I may, sexiest years to go on a succession of long-forgotten boyfriends rather than on the man you spend your life with? I mean, it's, it's pretty basic, but I know it goes against the grain of today's culture. At any rate, uh, Krista D'Souza, I think she's in her early 60s. And why do I tell you that? Because it is relevant. Okay, I'm not saying that there are not beautiful 60-year-old women. There are. And I'm not saying there are not beautiful 70-year-old women. There are. Uh, so please, let's just focus on what I am saying, not on what anybody might think I am really saying. So let's first of all take a look at the uh, column that was published in the British newspaper, the Daily Mail, recently, and it was all about an actor by the name of Paul Rudd, R-U-D-D. -D. Uh, Paul Rudd is a fairly successful actor. He's 52 years old, and uh, there's a silly magazine out there called People Magazine. Uh, it it does very well and makes a fair bit of money. So uh, the, the my silliness comment is uh, to be taken mi mildly. But in other words, it's it's a paper, it's a it's a journal, it's a magazine devoted to what I often uh, speak against and discourage, which is basically gossip, talking about people. You know, I, I, all this time I say, measure yourself and your relationships by what you talk about. Do you talk about ideas? Do you talk about things? Or do you talk about people? Okay, and, uh, and the less time you spend speaking about people and the more time you spend thinking uh, and talking about ideas, you know, the, the better off you are. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of People magazine, but I do find it a very interesting comment on today's culture. So People magazine does an annual Sexiest Man of the Year award and this year, they uh, vote Paul Rudd as the sexiest man alive. Okay, that would be the end of the story, excepting that this journalist, Krista D'Souza, writes a piece published by the Daily Mail in which she says, this is an example of everyday ageism. Um, and she says, you can bet a woman in her 50s would never get near that title of sexiest woman in the world, and this is because of society's double standard. My dear friends, devoted listeners of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, that is unadulterated bilge water. She's right that a woman is unlikely in her 50s to be voted sexiest woman alive, but, um, and that a man of 52 does get voted sexiest man alive by People magazine. All of that is true, but it's not because of society. It's because of biology. People are so intent on two things here. Number one, finding offense 
society is doing all these rotten things. And secondly, uh, people are wrongly convinced of the ability to change human nature. That simply isn't real. And so I'll tell you a little bit more of her column. Um, uh, Krista D'Souza bets that uh, no woman in her 50s could ever win the title of sexiest woman alive. She's absolutely right. Of course, that's true. Um, and then she goes on and says, um, sexism and ageism are these two evils that uh, uh, are constantly being conflated, meaning <laughs> mixed up. Uh, she writes, I was thinking this upon reading that 52-year-old 52, 52 actor Paul Rudd was voted Sexiest Man Alive by People magazine. Don't get me wrong, I think Rudd is attractive, but would the Sexiest Woman Alive award ever go to a woman of 52? And you know and I know the answer to that is, of course not. But it's got nothing to do with society or ageism or sexism. It's got to do with biology. But let me continue with her piece. And if People magazine were to go out on a limb and vote a 52-year-old woman, sexiest woman alive, can you imagine the judgment it would incite? Yeah, people would probably write in and say, are you mad? And then she goes, it's such a pernicious double standard. And yet it persists because society, however inclusive it thinks it is, has a block about accepting that women past reproductive age can be thought of as sexy. Okay, um, uh, Krista, when we guys think of a woman as sexy, uh, that's really not because anything society has told us. Yeah. Um, she says, in my opinion, well, at least she says it's in her opinion, my opinion, this primitive notion that women stop being sexy at a certain age is what links us more to animals than humans. I cannot continue to buy into it. Uh, I'm not going to buy potions and lotions to fool strangers into thinking. I might still just, etc., etc. So that's what it boils down to, uh, because you can bet that a woman who actually looked it to be in her 50s would never get anywhere near the title of sexiest woman alive. Yeah, that's absolutely true. What is so hard to understand about that? Um, God created men and women to be drawn to one another. And he also absolutely made women irresistibly attractive, mostly during the time that it would be best for them to bear children. That's just a reality. I'll tell you something else that's unfair about biology, and that is men can father children way into their age and women reach menopause. Women reach an age where they run out of eggs. That's it. Unfair? Yes. Is this because of society? No, it's actually because of biology. Is this because of sexism? No, it's because of biology. <laughs> you know, the, if this show is about anything, it's about learning how the world really works. And so um, uh, Krista D'Souza, who, by the way, is an attractive 61, 60-something-year-old lady. I, you know, she's, she's got nothing to complain about. Uh, but comparing her to a woman in her 20s or 30s is ridiculous. That's just not how the world really works. Not that that's the most important thing about a woman, not that it's uh, uh, that it means that women who are older have no value. I mean, you know all that, right? I don't have to keep issuing these caveats so you won't think I'm a terrible, terrible person. Uh, I'm talking about how the world really works. And the way the world really works is that God created men and women to marry and to join together for life. And um, that is best done earlier rather than later. It's a lot easier for a 22-year-old woman to get married than it is for a 32-year-old woman. And it's a lot easier for a 32-year-old woman than for a 42-year-old woman. And so understanding how the world really works means that whether you are a man or a woman, you make certain choices. You design your life. 
and if there's any service you want to perform for a younger person you know a, a child of yours a nephew a relative or or just somebody you're mentoring and that person is uh, you know past the age of 13 that's not too early to help that person understand the value in working out a life plan it doesn't mean you can never divert from it it doesn't mean that you're absolutely stuck uh, doing exactly what's on your plan that somehow at the age of 13 you have to write down what you're going to do when you're 50 no of course not but at least beginning to understand that there are certain realities about life and your five f's are really important and that if you are a woman and you're 14 years old it's not too early to start thinking about what you're going to be doing when would you like to get married and how are you going to try and uh, position yourself so as you can get married at the age you would like to get married and i say position yourself because another aspect krista <laughs> krista de souza hasn't written about this yes yet but i wish she would because it's bound to be entertaining and that is that, uh, uh, yes, it is true, speaking to this 14-year-old young lady, I would say to her, look, um, it's a reality, but you are going to have to wait to be invited out on a date to meet a guy. And later on, you're going to have to wait to be proposed to for marriage, right? Wouldn't it be fairer? Wouldn't it be more equitable? If we lived in a world where women could propose marriage to men, yeah, I, you know, I, I guess if you if you want to redesign reality, but um, in the foreseeable future, that is not happening. So, so that means you have to think about that early. And if I'm speaking to a 14 year old guy, I, I would say to him, you've got to think about how you want to live your life, and that has a lot to do with finance. That's one of your F's. And that means that you have to position yourself now already. You have to plan and think about how to plan your positioning so that you will be in a position to be of sufficient service to your fellow citizens, that you will be able to, in exchange, earn the income that you want. It's not too early to talk to a teenager about these things. And I know teenagers sometimes say, I'm a teenager. This is my time for having fun. Uh, if you're a parent, you really want to try and uh, uh, erase that way of thinking from within your family as quickly as possible. I don't know where your children got that idea from, that teenager years are the time to have fun. I don't know where they got it from, but I promise you one thing, they didn't get it from listening to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. That's for sure, I tell you that, no question. So I'm pretty sure that that's clear to everybody that, yes, um, it's, it's not fair that a 52-year-old man is still viewed as sexually attractive, whereas a 52-year-old woman would be less so. It is surely not fair that um, a 52-year-old man can easily... Um, father a child it's a lot less likely that a 50 year old woman can be a mother uh, is it fair no but instead of waving a defiant fist at the unfairness of the universe wouldn't it make more sense to learn how the world really works and adjust to it right? you'll have a happier life you'll have a more successful life and uh, this is one area where nature is very brilliantly designed. Uh, I say by the creator, as I believe, you can say whatever you like. But uh, the bottom line is neither of us can argue that nature is brilliantly designed for the, uh, the preservation of the species. Human beings are going to continue. And that's just how it is. And uh, the only mystery in this whole thing to me is how can a smart woman, and this Krista D'Souza is unquestionably uh, no slouch in that area, how can she possibly write a piece arguing that this is because of society's 
uh, prejudice against women, and that if we can just get over society's sexism, well, then 52-year-old women will be seen as just as sexy as 52-year-old men. Um, Not exactly. No, that isn't going to happen. And, um, you know, are there are there exceptions? <laughs> of course, of course, there are. But uh, generally speaking, what I've been telling you now is absolutely true. Something else that's absolutely true is that it seems to me as if perhaps for all its damage, and there's been considerable cultural damage in the United Kingdom, it is just possible that it might be slightly less damaged than the United States. Why do I say this? Because uh, in the United States, there continues to be this nonsensical talk about wind power and solar power replacing God-given fuels. Uh, And you all by now know what God-given fuels are. They're things like coal, uh, natural gas, uh, petroleum, All of those are one of the old-fashioned words they used to use for that, and I think backward people still call them fossil fuels. But those of us in the know and those who are up to date with reality know that uh, these are well known as GG fuels, God-given fuels. And in the United States, uh, the uh, current administration, as well as various previous administrations, have been hell-bent on destroying the United States economy by making it harder and more expensive to use God-given fuels, and instead of that, to use uh, fuel, to use wind power and solar power. That's not the topic for today, and I have to keep an eye on the clock to keep us moving right along. And so today, uh, I'm not going to do stuff I've done in the past, which is uh, share with you some of the basic mathematics on why wind power and solar power are never, never, never going to become the prime sources of power for any functioning modern Western-style economy. It ain't going to happen. And folks who live in California are already bearing the brunt of some of the craziness and this obsessive hysteria about using no God-given fuels and replacing them with wind and solar. Uh, So I'm not going to go into why I've done that before, but what I will raise now for your contemplation is that if this was really a good faith program, if they really, really believed that using God-given fuels is dangerous because it's going to raise the sea level and it's going to inundate all of seafront New York and Florida and any other low-lying part of the world is going to be inundated because we're burning God-given fuel. Even if that's what they believe, then don't you think they should be promoting nuclear power? There is no objection to it. There's literally no object. And again, I don't want to go into now, uh, you know, how reliable nuclear power is and how um, amazing uh, the Japanese disaster of Fukushima and uh, the um, also the uh, Chernobyl in Russia explaining and discussing what happened there or in the Pennsylvania uh, event and how little, you know, basically non-occurrences. I I don't want to discuss that now because, again, if you in any way are dubious about the safety and the economy and the, the, the fantastic aspect of nuclear power, you don't need me. You just need uh, an hour of research time on your computer, and you will get as much information as as you need that will show you that it's madness that the United States is not pursuing nuclear power. And uh, one can only assume stupidity or malfeasance. You know, either they are hysterical children locked into this idea that everything has to come from the most primitive natural sources, wind and sunlight, right? Exactly what what shaped uh, the economy in the 16th century, windmills and uh, sunlight keeping people warm in the daytime. I mean, really, because 
what possible reason can they have for ignoring nuclear power? It's insane. It just makes no sense. But it is a cultural hysteria. I believe that it has religious roots, not my religion, the religion of secular fundamentalism. And, uh, and I believe that that's why they rule out nuclear power. And I'll talk about that some other time. But in England, such is not the case. First of all, um, several European countries are producing far more, a far greater proportion of electricity from nuclear than the United States is. Nuclear, the United States is shuttering nuclear power plants. But along comes Rolls-Royce. And Rolls-Royce has set up strategic partnerships with a, a number of, of different companies uh, in the United Kingdom. And um, uh, they are, they've also secured, this is Rolls-Royce, the company that makes Rolls-Royce cars. They also make Rolls-Royce jet engines. And um, they have, have joined up now uh, with with various organizations and uh, like British nuclear organizations and Cavendish Nuclear. Cavendish Nuclear is a, a big uh, nuclear power plant uh, engineering firm in England. Anyway, Rolls-Royce has created this great big department in the Rolls-Royce Corporation uh, to produce small modular reactors. Now, you might say, what's an SMR? What's a small modular reactor? And in asking that question, you'd be asking exactly the question I asked when I first began to be aware of this movement um, during the summer of 2021. I, I became aware of it at first, and it's taken me a while to get myself wrapped around it all to the point where I felt comfortable sharing it with you. And uh, I am not sure that this doesn't even present a very good investment opportunity. Uh, but be very, very cautious. I'm not recommending it because I have not fully uh, satisfied myself yet, but I'm certainly looking at it and contemplating Rolls-Royce as a good uh, medium to longer term play right now because of the SMR program. What is the SMR? Pro a small modular reactor, and this is very clever, is a nuclear reactor and power plant. You understand that in nuclear generation of electricity, the nuclear section just produces heat. And the heat then is used to drive machinery such as, for instance, a steam turbine, which converts the heat into rotating motion. And just as, by the way, the heat of burning jet fuel is converted into rotating motion within a jet engine. And uh, and then the rotating motion of, shall we say, a steam turbine is attached to a conventional electrical generator. And these are the three parts then. The nuclear reactor produces heat, the uh, turbine section produces motion, and the uh, electricity generating plant converts motion into electrical power. Now, the genius of this is that Rolls-Royce and Cavendish and the various other members of their consortium, they are saying to themselves, look, through green activity and governmental regulation, it is clear that um, various coal power plants, coal-fired power plants, are going to be uh, retired. And so what we're going to come up with is a modular nuclear power station that can sit in exactly that same footprint and that will be 90% delivered by train and by truck and assembled on site. Uh, my friends, what I think this means is that a, a, an electrical utility plant that is being pressured by regulatory, governmental, and also perhaps economic reasons to close a long-standing, you know, it might be a 50-year-old uh, electrical generating plant running on coal. And what they can do is close it down, demolish it, and do that very quickly, 
and very quickly bring a SMR, a nuclear, uh, a small modular reactor, onto site. These things uh, take about uh, the size of about one and a half football fields. That's about how big it is, which is, you know, can you, I mean, and oh, by the way, we're talking about one that will power about a million homes. That's huge. About a million homes. That, that's a very, very decent, sizable plant. It's not by any means the biggest plants we've got, but it's an, a way in which a coal-fired plant that is becoming um, defunctional and non-functional and is going to be closed down, the electricity utility can, in a very short space of time, be generating electricity at that site again from nuclear power which is hugely convenient because the distribution plant is already there. All the transformers and termination of the grid and the power connections are all right there because of the, uh, because of the, the existing coal-fired plant. And so uh, 90% of this gets shipped by train or by truck, gets assembled on site very quickly, they they also have landscaping facilities so that it, it looks nice and yeah no you know no no tall uh, chimney stacks no no emissions of any kind at all and some of you are saying oh what about the nuclear waste and the danger and as i said before i don't want to take the time in this show to talk about that i've done it in the past but just do your own research if you're genuinely interested which i'm sure you are and uh, you will quickly discover that this is a very neat idea. It's the sort of idea that once upon a time, uh, in an earlier ta- t- t- period in America, this would have been an American concept. Hey, let's figure out a way to quickly and easily transform coal plants into nuclear plants, and we just continue generating even more electricity uh, without any neighborhood or emission problems. As a matter of fact, Uh, It'll also do something for real estate because nobody wants to live anywhere near a coal electricity plant, but uh, no reason not to live near a nuclear generating plant. Really, no reason at all. Uh, You buy yourself a a little radiation Geiger counter if you want to, and, and, and you'll see. I mean, it is literally not a problem. Uh, So that's it just seems to me a very very clever idea i'm going to be keeping my eye on it and uh, and um, and i'm going to see what what moves along there but it's a shame again as an american citizen to me it's a shame that this is being done by rolls royce in the united kingdom and not by general electric in the united states but i think the very fact of that tells us a great deal about where america is at right now um, back in 2015, 2014, 2016, you, if you are a long-time listener of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, uh, you might remember me talking about how uh, autonomous vehicles are nowhere in the future, right? We're not seeing them anytime in the foreseeable future. And uh, some of you wrote in to me, to tell me things which I already knew, such as the fact that in 2016, for for instance, uh, the president of Lyft, which is a competitor to Uber, uh, his name was John Zimmer, and he said that uh, the majority of urban trips carried out by Lyft, the ride-sharing company, would take place in fully autonomous cars uh, by 2021. Well, I don't have to tell you that it is 2021 and that's not happening. Um, this is one of the biggest technology companies in the world is based in Beijing. It's called uh, Beidou, B-A-I-D-U. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, the head of Wang Jim, and I, I told you this back in 2015 on this show, I told you that Wang Jin, the head of Baidu, um, said that the startup would be selling driverless cars to uh, every consumer in China by 2020. Uh, Baidu is still not selling any driverless cars at all. And by the way, not surprisingly, Wang Jim is uh, he's no he's no longer uh, the head of the company. Um, 
it went, I mean, this more, all along, and I kept, I, I devoted more than one show to this in 2015 and 2016. Um, Business Insider magazine uh, in 2016. I, I remember commenting on this on the time that 10 million self-driving cars would be operating on the roads of America by 2020. Well, I don't have to tell you that that hasn't happened. But what I did have to tell you was back in 2016, I told you it wouldn't happen. Am I being a bit of an Ayatollah here, like Ayatollah Yuso? Uh Yeah, I guess I guess I am. But uh, I want you to fully appreciate the inestimable value of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, where, yes, you do get an insight not only into the past, not only into the present, but, excitingly enough, into the future as well. And so um, if... You know, if you were listening back in 2015 and 2016, then here's one thing you might remember, because it did stand out. A lot of people wrote in to me about this. I told you that one of the reasons that we would not be seeing autonomous cars in the near future is because if, uh, heaven forbid, you're driving along and, and a, a road crisis looms up all of a sudden and you've got a chance, you've got to make an instant choice of uh, hitting the uh, semi-trailer ahead of you loaded up with steel beams that will decapitate you as you run forward into the stalled semi or alternatively you swerve to the right you haven't got enough time to know what's to the right of you but just intuitively inside your brain in a split second you say to yourself i'd rather hit a, a car side on on the side of me than i would uh, hit stationary steel beams protruding out of the back of the semi you know what nobody's going to blame you if in so doing you cause an accident to that car next to you with even casualties it's it's a sad tragic accident nobody's going to blame you because we make those split second decisions but the trouble with autonomous cars is that this has to be pre-programmed and uh, companies in Israel, programming companies in Israel, were being hired in 2016. I told you about all this. They were being hired to write morality programming for autonomous cars. Namely, in advance, you have to tell the car what to do in that situation. Now, when you buy a Tesla, and uh, and it, it is not even self-driving, but to some extent it can do something on the highway, although to what extent you should trust it, I don't know. But um, in a, an autonomous car, you buy an autonomous, a really autonomous car, which you can't do at the moment, but back in 2016, they would say, oh, it's just around the corner. In a few years, we're going to have 10 million autonomous cars on the road. And I told you at the time it was unadulterated bilge water. I told you. And um, and part of the reason was, I said, because uh, when you buy your car, you would have a right to ask how it's been programmed to kill you or to kill an innocent bystander. And I'm not sure you'll like the answer either way. So that was one of the reasons I told you that uh, when things happen on the road today, we accept it. Act of God, accident happens. But if I'm driving a car, I want to know whether it's programmed to kill me or whether it's programmed to veer left or veer right and take its chances. But again, what, what most experienced drivers would do in a crisis situation like that is definitely try and avoid the head-on and move into the next lane, even though that will probably cause an accident with a side swipe. It may even be a tragic accident. But uh, that's what most of us would do unthinkingly. Uh, but to do it thinkingly with an advanced program on your autonomous, that's a different kettle of fish altogether and not one that uh, I think most people are going to, uh, to be happy doing. That's one of the reasons I told you five, six years ago, uh, these self-drive cars not going to happen. I covered other aspects of it as well. Uh, but the main point I said was is that it is a solution seeking a problem that's what it is it's a solution looking desperately for a problem i have no problem 
I like getting into my car and driving. I have no problem. As a matter of fact, I would rather get in my car and drive than getting into the back seat and uh, have the car drive me. And on those occasions where I really, really, really need to be concentrating in the back seat and not driving, you know what I do? I hire a driver for the day. That's what I do. It's, it's, it's a very reasonable and worthy expense. You do it. And you know how many times I've done that in the last five years? I can count it on, on one hand. I haven't had to do it often. And that's not even considering the possibility of ordering an Uber or a Lyft. So you can do it. But in terms of a self-drive car, no. I want a car with a steering wheel and brakes where I sit in the driver's seat. That's what I like doing. And so autonomous cars were a solution that didn't have a problem. And that's one of the reasons I told you at the time, nothing to worry about, not going to happen real soon. I didn't see any value or, or uh, wisdom in investing in companies that were working on autonomous cars. Didn't make sense to me. And uh, same way as I told you in, in the last year, I've told you about battery-operated vertical takeoff uh, air taxis. Right? Don't hold your breath for reasons that I've discussed. Um, and so cleverness for its own sake doesn't appeal to me. It's show-offy and does nothing. Cleverness for its own sake, a solution that hasn't found its problem. I like problems that bring about solutions. I like solutions that solve problems. Whenever somebody comes to me and says, uh, what do you think of my business idea? I always say, what is the problem it's solving? And if the person starts off with the word, well, it means they haven't worked this out yet. Because that's where you start off. If you're thinking of a business, you start off and say, this is the problem that people face. My invention, my software, my machine solves that problem. Here are some more predictions that are solutions in search of a problem and uh, are a complete waste of time. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the space predictions where uh, people like Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Richard Branson in the United Kingdom with Virgin and Yuri Milner is an Israeli Russian, he's a Russian who also who lives in Israel. He's a billionaire who um, uh, has also funded a space race. It's so interesting to me, isn't it? It's almost like it's almost like um, people like Musk and Bezos, and maybe to, to some extent uh, Branson also. They're like uh, kids who got a lot of money. And they're able to have their own Star Wars and their own space adventures. And um, the reason I say this is because I want to make absolutely clear, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that I am 100% certain that nothing of any value emerges from these space adventures. It's a total waste of time. And my best proof of that is that the best they can come up with is that, well, we're preparing to colonize space. And, uh, and that's exactly what Elon Musk just recently said, that it's going to be necessary to move people to Mars, and there are going to be millions of human beings living on Mars. And uh, sometimes it, when they want a, a very expensive vacation, they'll do a trip back to Earth in the same way that people nowadays visit the Grand Canyon or, or Yellowstone, because Earth will be the sort of uh, national park of the universe. Okay, this sort of stuff is laughably insane. Um, why, why do I say that? Well, first of all, um, the only good that I'm aware of that's come out of uh, space is satellites, communication satellites. And there was no reason to go to the moon for that. Um, and there is no reason to go back to the moon, none whatsoever. Please, I, I beg you, just think about this rationally. Don't buy into the NASA public relations stunts, right? The um, 
the NASA, North American Space Administration. Uh, obviously, they're trying to get funding. It's a huge organization. It's become an institution with a life of its own, and they want to get Congress to give them funding. So they're constantly dropping tantalizing little hints. But the bottom line is that nothing of any value has come out of any of these. I know this is a uh, this is a rather uh, stark statement, and I should temper it by saying, well, not a whole lot of good has come out of, but nothing has. I mean, really. Uh, you know, a sugary orange drink, and uh, and people claim, by the way, all kinds of things. Oh, well, we got this because of this. It's not true. These are things that either were already in development or would have been in development because they were solutions to existing problems. But there is no problem. You see, uh, Musk is saying, well, people are going to have to move to Mars. I understand, and, and I'm sure you do too, that during the 19th century, when large numbers of people from Ireland and England and Europe, Italy, Sweden, um, people moved, immigrated to the United States during the 1900s, large numbers of them, there was a very good reason for it. They were starving to death in Ireland. They were being killed in Russia. They were starving in Italy. There was a very good reason for it. Life in London was miserable in the 1900s. You know, have have you not read any of uh, Charles Dickens' stuff? Life in, in the Midlands in England was miserable. And an opportunity to emigrate to the United States? Fantastic. It made perfect sense. But let me tell you, if there were already stations and colonies on Mars, people there would be figuring out how to move to the planet Earth, not the other way around. This is a little bit like the Mediterranean, right? There's nobody, nobody in France or Italy risking their lives trying to sail rickety little boats to get to Libya. They're not. But there are many, many, many people from Middle East and North Africa who risk their lives sailing across the Mediterranean to get to France and Italy. Yeah, that's right. I can understand people on Mars risking their lives to get to Earth. But why on Earth? I mean, it's so laughably insane. Why would anybody on Earth want to move to Mars? It's crazy. Well, in the future, one day it's going to be necessary. Let me tell you something. A lot of the problems we deal with today are the result of society trying to solve problems that haven't got here yet. Well, it's too late when the problem gets here. No, it isn't. Never has been. What are you talking about? Problems, you know, when when the famine came to Ireland, people picked up and emigrated to the United States. They did that. But, um, and if global warming is a true reality, which I dispute and don't for a moment believe, but if it is a reality, then, um, and people, well, the, the science is settled on this. Please don't cite this rubbish to me. Science is settled on this. Uh, no, it isn't. And if it was, I would be able to buy oceanfront property in North Carolina and in uh, Uh, Georgia and in Florida for very, very cheap. And I don't know if you've looked at prices of waterfront property lately, but not a single person who owns waterfront property thinks that they're going to be washed away by rising water levels any time in the foreseeable future. So uh, I'm not the only one who doesn't believe it. The only difference is I don't pay lip service to it. Uh, I'm at least honest about it. It's not a reality. But uh, if it does become a reality one day, it'll be ample time then. It really will. It, you know, people, people will see the problem. You won't have to worry about pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. Everybody will see, hey, you know what? The, the earth is warming up. It's getting unpleasantly hot each year. And I can see it's going hotter and hot. Fine, then we need to do something about it. But trying to solve problems that haven't got here yet is a bad, bad move. Um, let's say you know. Let's say you're a uh, a 25 year old man or woman, and uh, somebody says, you know what? There's a sale on wheelchairs. You say, well, you know, eventually 
you know, I'm going to be old. There's a good chance I'm going to need a wheelchair. Why don't I go ahead and solve the problem, buy it now, right? You realize that that's just plain dumb, right? Because they'll have better ones then and you'll have money to buy it then and you don't have to worry about where you're going to store it for the next 50 or 60 years. It doesn't make sense. You don't solve problems that aren't here. You do, investing is different, by the way, to make sure that you have funds for when you want to raise a family and you work towards that. That's wise. Obviously, you're doing that. But that's not solving a problem that may or may not come. That is wise management of your present energies and resources. It's a very, very different thing. And so uh, there it is. The, uh, the, the, uh, the billionaire's hobby is space at the moment. And they've got to come up with some justification for it. They can't say it's producing scientific breakthroughs because it isn't. And so they say, well, we're preparing space for colonization. And um, that really is. Uh, and by the way, I don't begrudge them. It's their money. They earn that money. Honestly, good luck to them. If they want to spend it on rockets, God bless them. Go for it. Uh, I have no problem with that at all. And I, I laugh with disdain at the uh, small minded people who say, well, they should spend their money on solving global climate change or they should spend their money on solving the homeless problem. You know what? You spend your money the way you want to and let them spend money the way they want to. Uh, one of the fundamental moral decisions which people have to arrive at very quickly is, does anybody else have a right to your money? And the answer is no. By a pact with society, I agree to the government being able to tax me. When I made that pact, I sure didn't think I was going to be paying, you know, 50% in taxation, direct and indirect taxation. Uh, I certainly didn't think I was going to be paying 30% in direct taxation. But the concept that I agree to, it doesn't mean I'm saying that other people have a right to my money. I know that the government takes some of my money and gives it to other people as part of their grand redistributive scheme. I get that. But it doesn't mean they have a right to it. I grant that the government can take some of my money. I don't like everything they do with it, but I grant that. But it doesn't mean that anyone else has a right to my money. This is not a selfish statement. This is not callous and lacking in compassion. It's a fundamental morality. But wait, what about charity? Yeah, right. I, charity is my obligation, not your right. John and Jane and Jeffrey do not have a right to my money. But I have an obligation to give away 10% of my income. Now, I might choose to give it to John and Jane and Jeffrey, but I could just as easily choose to give it to somebody else. And if I choose to give it to somebody who I believe is doing more for society than John and Jane and Jeffrey, then I'll give it to them. That's how charity works. It's, um, it's very different from a government-administered system, goes without saying. So please do remember that you heard it here first. Uh, these billionaire ventures into space, it's a hobby, not solving any problem. It's a solution for a problem that simply doesn't exist. Right? Nobody, none of us, very few of us, okay, fine, a handful of us, but almost none of us are sitting around saying, you know, I'm, I really wanted to go to Grand Canyon National Park next month, but I'm going to hold off on that because maybe I can go to Mars instead. Right? Nobody's saying that. I promise you, although they, t they tell you, oh, the scenery, the views you see from space are incredible. I bet they are. The, the picture of the Earth rising over the moon, it's a great picture. And um, seeing it in reality, eh, you know what? I'm, I'm given the, the downside. I'm OK looking at a picture of it. And, and really, I mean, is the view from space better than the view from the beach in Barcelona? Or is it better than the Canadian Rockies? Or is it better than Zion National Park in Utah? I mean, really, if you want a view, there's some really nice places on this beautiful planet of ours you can go to if COVID regulations will let you travel. There are a lot of nice places to go to, no question about it. But um, 
the idea that people are waiting to go into space, not happening. There was a reason why millions of people migrated from Poland and Russia to the United States. And they, life was miserable where they were. But why would anybody go from Earth, where life is pretty good, to Mars? A place that is almost unthinkably hostile to life? I don't think so. And, um, and there's one more point with which I will wrap us up for today's show. But in many ways, it's the most important point of the whole show. At least to me, it is. And that is that um, when you think of space, you know, the association of ideas, the word that comes to you when you think of space, isn't it vastness? emptiness, the vast emptiness of space, right? I mean, that, that's what space is. And I want to tell you something, um, and that is that uh, we human beings have had our lives immeasurably enriched. Our lives have become longer and healthier and safer and more pleasurable because of research and scientific study and exploration. But, my friends, it's nearly always been done with a microscope, not a telescope. And I've done a show a few years ago. You can go back to earlier shows if you're interested in this in detail. But uh, it, nanotechnology, that's done a whole lot more for us than space exploration. Even the solution to COVID. Provo you know, you may be one of those people who's very dedicated to the idea that the vaccine is the solution to COVID. Um, how was the vaccine discovered? With a telescope or a microscope? Looking downwards and small or upwards and huge? It's to the small. Uh, atomic power. Earlier I spoke about the incredible wonder of generating limitless electrical power at, uh, by the way, I mean, far, far less expensively than generating power with oil, coal, or gas is generating it with nuclear power. How wonderful that is. Where was this invented? In space or in the atom? No, go small, go down, not big and up, small and down. That's where it's discovered. All medical, all genetic stuff, all of that work is with a microscope. It's examining the tiny. It's going downwards. And, and what's more, if we look at the trend, the, the trend over the last few centuries in the world is a movement in increasing the ratio of weight to value. What I mean by that is that uh, the ratio of weight to value of a railway locomotive, right? right? In the, uh, in the uh, early 20th century, America was the premier builder of heavy, heavy machinery, cranes, railway locomotives. And if you took the weight of a railway locomotive in pounds or tons and you divided it into the value, you got a certain figure. But if you look at the other extreme today, software, the weight is almost negligible. The value is high. And so the value to weight ratio of what America produces or what the Western world produces has been changing dramatically. So today, you know, where do you go to, to get heavy machinery? You go to China now because it's at an earlier stage of its economic development. You will remember when Japan began eating America's lunch. And yes, it's true, you can still buy John Deere tractors and you can buy Caterpillar earth-moving machinery, all American. But if you look on any construction site, a lot of the machinery is going to be Japanese or Chinese because big, heavy things are not as economically productive to produce as high-value light things. In other words, as econom economies develop, the ratio of weight to value keeps going up. And so if um, I buy, shall we say, a bottle of expensive French perfume for my wife, I may be spending, you know, $200 for half an ounce, perhaps. So that's a very high weight to ratio, right? I mean, that's approaching software <laughs> margins, but um, if I were to buy a, uh, a lawnmower, 
you can't compare the, the price to weight, the value to weight ratio. It's not even close. The value to weight ratio of a lawnmower is much lower than a bottle of perfume and much lower than a piece of software. And a lawnmower has a better value to weight ratio than a, uh, a steamroller does and so on and so forth. So um, the, the point is, what I'm trying to explain is that space is huge and vast and empty, but going small is packed and rich and unbelievably filled with potential. That's the strange thing. And, um, and, and that is why I don't believe that we're going to see anything of value. I like satellites, putting satellites up there, but that's not going to the moon. That's going a, a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface, putting a synchronous satellite in place so as that I can talk to a friend in Nigeria uh, with at a moment's hesitation. I pick up my phone and I get a connection through the satellite. It's wonderful. It's miraculous. Again, most of that work it, most of the ability to do that is by studying and exploring in the small, not the huge. Um, the electronics work on micro circuits and integrated circuits where electrical paths are being computed at a molecular level. That's where it's at. And so you want to study molecular biology you're doing something that could produce great value. There's no question about it. You want to study astrophysics, wasting of wasting a time. It's it's not quite as bad as doing gender studies at uh, the, your local kindergarten, but uh, it's a close second. There's just no point in it. Now, I realize I am swimming upstream against the cultural tide here, but um, nonetheless, as I say, I think it's more important that I tell the truth than that I make friends, and so <laughs> as much as I like making friends as well, and if I have, please go to my website and send me a hello, and, uh, and that is pretty much what I wanted to leave you with, closing with the, um, the, the single idea that we are coming close to um, religious holidays, and I'll, I'll talk predominantly about uh, the one I know best, which is the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah starts off lighting one tiny little candle on Sunday night, the 28th of December, 2021. That's when Hanukkah begins, and it runs for the next eight days. And um, the theme of Hanukkah is exactly what I'm talking about. The theme of Hadukah is the triumph of the tiny over the vast. That's what it is. It's one tiny little light that turns into two lights and turns into three and eventually eight, and the darkness is banished by one tiny little light. It is a triumph of the tiny over the vast. And this is true for each and everything we do. It's not only that studying the atom is more valuable than studying the reaches of outer space. It is. There's no question about it. Study molecules, study the way small bio biological features uh, operate in the human body and in cacti and in oak trees and everywhere else and in kangaroos. Yeah, there's value in all of that. Look at the small rather than the big. Do you want to change the world? Do you want to make the world a better place? I've got a really good idea. Why don't you make your family a better place? Start right there. Go small, not big, because the results are immense. It's true. One person can really make a very big difference, but you have to start small, not big. Right? You don't need to change the way people think about homelessness. Yeah, you, all you have to do is make sure that your family isn't homeless. And after that, you've got to make sure your extended family isn't homeless. And after that, make sure that members of your faith family, members of your church or synagogue, the people who play a role in your life are okay and safe from becoming homeless. That's all you have to do. You have to start at the small end, not at the big end. And that is the message of this time of the year. 
one tiny little Hanukkah light. That's right. Focus on that little flame because that little F flame can lead you to develop the F of your family, the F of your friends, the F of your finances, the F of your faith, and the F of your fitness, all of those things. Don't worry about outer space. Worry about your inner space. Worry about becoming a better person. Uh, is it remotely possible that as wonderful as you and I really are, and we are wonderful, is it possible that we could be better people, better friends, better parents, better spouses? Could we be a little bit better? Could we eliminate our tendency towards anger? Could we just get that out of our system so nobody ever sees us angry? That would be great. And actually, that's harder than solving the homeless problem or s producing a human colony on Mars. I mean, this stuff is all very fine. But why don't you tackle the really tough problems first, the ones that really can affect change? And, uh, and that's really what uh, Hanukkah is about. Uh, Hanukkah is about lighting a candle. Where? In your house. Now, it's true that in many cities around the United States that have Jewish populations, um, they, um, some Jews start lighting a big 6-foot, 9-foot, 12-foot tall Hanukkah menorah in the village square or in front of City Hall, and then the ACLU sues, and there's all fun and games all around. Um, and, and they do that because, uh, after all, it's sort of become part of American life. Uh, I love to see a Christmas tree going up outside City Hall or inside City Hall. Uh, I love to have a Christmas tree lighting ceremony. I like to see that happening in towns around America. And it does happen in the better towns, the places that are more pleasant to live in around America. And so many Jews have said, well, you know, let's go out there also and light the Hanukkah menorah. It's not my thing, and I don't think it's a Jewish idea because the, uh, the entire value system that structures the Hanukkah candle emphasizes the home. And, uh, and that's why it is. You'll, you'll drive through a Jewish neighborhood, and from, for the eight days starting from uh, that Sunday night in December, uh, you will see that uh, in the windows of houses, soon after dark, you will see the Hanukkah lights out there. Uh, a beacon of light pushing back the darkness in everybody's home. That's the place to start, in your own home. Not changing the world, not changing out of space, just in your own home. Much, much harder to do it that way. Uh, no newspaper reporters will come around asking for stories. Uh, no, it's all quiet, but that's where the real change does happen. So enough of that for now, my friends. Uh, as you can tell, it's always hard for me to end because I love the chance of talking with you. Uh, I encourage you to visit the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. You might want to make sure you get yourself a Rabbi Daniel Lappin recommended Bible. Uh, you might even want to get a, an audio program on Hanukkah that I have at my site, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, you can, of course, become a happy warrior and that's the best part of it at all because that is the community in which we really do interact uh, we happy warriors.com so go ahead and do all of that stay in touch love you and uh, looking forward to being back together with you in another week here on the rabbi daniel lappin show and until then wishing you a week of real progress not in outer space, but with your family, your friends, your finance, your faith, and your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.